The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the epistle of Paul to the Philippians, the third chapter and the seventh verse. The seventh verse in the third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. But what things were gained to me, I, those I counted loss for Christ. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. I want, in other words, to consider once more the great and remarkable case of the conversion of this mighty man whom we call the Apostle Paul. We begin the consideration of this great and striking event in history last Sunday evening when we looked at it in terms of the way he puts it in the epistle to the Galatians in the first chapter at the end where he says in uh, verses 22 and 23 and 24 that he was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ but they had heard only he says that he which uh, persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed and they glorified God in me. I would again remind you that we are looking into this great case not merely because of its uh, intrinsic merit and because of its entrancing interest. It is, as I indicated last Sunday, uh, one of the great uh, stories of all time. If you're interested in dramatics even, you'll find nothing more striking than the conversion of Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. If you're interested in what's so popular today and which is called psychology, well, you'll never find a more striking case than this. If you're interested in uh, human greatness, interested in great personalities, interested in great men, men who've affected the course of events and have in a sense molded the course of history. Well, you can't uh, spend your time more profitably than in uh, reading and considering what we are told in the scriptures uh, concerning this extraordinary man. And as I said, if you're only interested in the mere course of history in a purely secular sense, you can't afford uh, to ignore this because, after all, the Christian Church has been one of the dominant factors in history, looked at purely from the secular standpoint. And there is no man who stands out more brightly and who shines with such luster in the history of the Church than this man, the Apostle Paul. So, I say, from all those different angles, it is a very interesting and a very important story. But I say that I'm calling attention to it, not for any one of those reasons, good and sufficient though they are. I'm calling attention to it because of its message, because of what it has to tell us and to teach us. The Apostle himself entitles us to do that. He says in his first epistle to Timothy, Something like this, he says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He says he is a kind of illustration. He's an example. He's a pattern. And it is in that way and in that sense that I am directing your attention to this remarkable event which took place in his life and which turned him from being the persecuting Saul of Tarsus into the preacher, the Apostle Paul. And I do so in order that we may learn certain things. The great thing we are concerned about is this. Though this man was outstanding in his abilities and in his gifts, and though he was called in a very special way uh, to be an apostle and the witness of the resurrection of Christ, 
He himself, of all men, keeps on telling us that as a Christian, he was in exactly the same position as everybody else. So that what happened to him as a Christian, qua Christian, is something that can happen to all of us. And that is why I'm calling attention to this great event, this great change that took place in him. We looked hurriedly last Sunday evening at his character. We saw his mastery of life and of circumstances. We saw him singing hymns in a prison at midnight with his feet fast in the stocks. We saw him telling a great company that was seated upon thrones in the midst of luxury while he stood before them with chains hanging from his wrists that he felt sorry for them and that he dearly wished that they were as he was. We listened to him saying, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content. And I asked this question, I said, wouldn't you like to be like that? Wouldn't you like to have this man's view of life? Wouldn't you like to have his view of death? Wouldn't you like to be able with Paul to say, to me to die is gain? It's far better for it means to be with Christ. A man who lived every moment of his life, not some recluse. Not a monk living in a cell divorced from society. No, a man who worked with his own hands and continued as a tent maker, who mixed with people and was amongst the masses of the people, working, traveling, indefatigable. He lived every moment, every second of his life, to the full, to the maximum, and contributed so magnificently and generously and gloriously to the lives of other people. He lived like that and he died like that. I say, wouldn't you like to be like that? Now the whole business of Christianity is to tell us that we can be like that. That we can share the same kind of life as he had. That the quality of our life may be like that. Oh, we'll never become great apostles like this. We are not meant to be. We are not called to be. But as I say, to share the Christian life, to know that kind of experience, is what is offered to all who become Christian, to all who believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is in order that from a study of what happened to this man and how he became a Christian, in order that we may learn from all that how we may enter into this same wealthy place in which he found himself, and in which he so greatly rejoiced that I am calling your attention to his conversion. Because obviously, if we are not clear about the way of entry in, we shall never enjoy it. And that is the trouble with such large numbers. There are many people who would give anything to have the experience of the Apostle Paul, and they say they're looking for it, but they never seem to get there. And I'm suggesting that that is because, somewhere or another, they have gone wrong, they have gone astray, either in their ideas of what a Christian is, or as to how one becomes a Christian. There are pitfalls. There's an adversary of our souls called the devil who does his utmost to stand between us and becoming what the Apostle Paul was. But thank God we've got here the scriptures which teach us and show us the way of life and of salvation. And there is no more convenient way of doing that than just to make a study of this man. He tells us in these little bits of autobiography something of what happened to him. And especially he shows us the difficulties. Now then, last Sunday night we began by defining in general this remarkable thing that happened to him. And I say that becoming a Christian always includes these things. It always means that something happens to us and that God deals with us. You can't be a Christian without God dealing with you and God doing something to you. That's the essence of being a Christian. It is primarily an action of God upon the soul of men. It happened to this man, it's happened to every other Christian. We emphasized also that it leads to a very complete change. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith 
which once he condemned and persecuted. It's very difficult, isn't it, as you read the epistles of Paul and as you read his preaching in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, it's very difficult to believe and to realize that that man was once a violent persecutor of the Christian faith and that it was ever true to say of him that he went down from Jerusalem to Damascus breathing out threatenings and slaughter. It's almost incredible. The change was so great, it was so complete, it was so profound. But my friends, that is what the New Testament tells us. Happens to everybody who becomes a Christian. The dramatic element may not always be there, but the change in the person is always there. A person who becomes a Christian is changed in every respect. In mind and outlook, in heart and feeling, and in will, in practice, in action, in behavior. The Christian is a man who has a new outlook, a new understanding. To use the jargon, he has a new orientation. He is a new man. He is a new creation. He has indeed been born again. The life of God has entered into his soul. He's a new person. That's essential. It's a part of this gospel. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not only that, we saw that this is a life, this new life that he receives, dominates and controls him. And in that sense, likewise, he's not the man he once was, because he's dominated by something that wasn't there before. And therefore he must be entirely different. We also pointed out that it's a change that others can see. He who once persecuted us now preacheth the faith that once he condemned. And we finally ended by saying this, that all these things result from a changed attitude towards the faith. He preaches the faith that once he persecuted. Ah yes, it was his changed attitude towards these truths that determines everything. Well now then, let us take up at that point and let me ask this question. If we haven't had this experience, if we, if we are not Christians in this sense, why are we not Christians? What is it that stands between anybody and living the kind of life that was lived by the Apostle Paul? Now, I'm taking it for granted that you all agree with me that this is real life. This is true life. This is a man. This is real living. This isn't shuffling through life. This, this isn't an apology of a life. This is true life and living. And I'm taking it for granted that we all would like to live like this. Well, if we are not, why not? Why is it that uh, we are not Christians in this sense, if we are not? Well, the answer to the question is that there are, as I say, certain hindrances and obstacles. There are certain misconceptions with regard to the nature of the Christian life and as to how one enters into it. And tonight I want in particular to deal with some of them. Fortunately they are displayed before us in the case of the Apostle Paul himself. And I'm going to confine our consideration tonight entirely to what we find here in the case of this great and extraordinary man. He tells us about them. He's ashamed of them as he looks back. But there they are, their effect, and they literally took place. So let's look at them. There were certain things that stood between Paul and this way of life. He'd heard of it long before he had it. He had persecuted it, as I'm reminding you. There it was, waiting for him. He might have been what he afterwards became, but he wasn't. Why wasn't he? What was it that held him back? What was it that hindered this man? What was it that restrained him and stood between him and immediately entering upon this life the moment he first heard of it? Well, let's look at what he tells us. Because the things that hindered Paul are the things that are still hindering people. There are certain radical, fundamental misconceptions which must be got rid of before anybody can become a Christian. I'm simply going to note them tonight. There's a list of them. Here they are. The first is 
this whole question of birth. You remember what he says here, if any man's got a right to boast in a natural sense, says Paul, I more. And then he gives us his list. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, and so on and so forth. Paul, you see, has been relying upon the fact that he was a Jew. He classified mankind into two groups, as all the Jews did. You were either a Jew, or else you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. If you were a Jew, you belonged to the commonwealth of Israel, you were one of God's people, and if you were not, well, you were outside, you were beyond the pale, you were without God in the world, and you were hardly worthy of consideration, you were a kind of dog, despised, because you were not a Jew. Now the Apostle Paul was very proud of these things as he tells us. To him it was a marvelous and a wonderful thing that he was a Jew and had all these privileges that he belonged to God's people. And yet you see what he makes so tragically plain and clear here is this, that that was one of the very things that stood between him and becoming a Christian. That was the thing that explains his fury and his persecuting zeal. For he regarded Jesus of Nazareth as one who was cutting a cross all that, and who was even admitting Gentiles into these blessings, the thing that was unthinkable. He was relying, I say, upon his natural birth. He was relying upon the nation to which he belonged. He was relying upon these human relationships, and he relied upon them and trusted them so much that they blinded him to the truth of the gospel and kept him outside the kingdom. I don't want to stay long with this first point tonight, but I think it's still very pertinent. There are still large numbers of people who are still acting on the assumption that everybody born in this country is a Christian. They still talk about Christian nations. It's the old fallacy. You know how they say, well, I, I've always been a Christian. They rely as Paul did upon nation, or perhaps upon family, or perhaps upon upbringing. Always taking it for granted, they say. Never even doubted it for a moment. Always assumed that I'm a Christian. As if to say, well, in a country like this, of course, and having been brought up in this way, you can't help being a Christian. Now, how common that is? Now let's be quite clear about this. The things which the Apostle here lists are very good in and of themselves, and they have a real value and a real worth. The Jews, after all, were God's people, and they'd had the oracles of God and so on and so forth. There was a value in all these things he mentions, yes. But the moment you think that they're enough and that they're sufficient and that you rest upon them and rely upon them, they become the greatest enemies of your soul. Thank God for every good tradition. Thank God for parents who took us to the house of God when we were young. Thank God for a good background, for a good training for all instruction and teaching. Thank God even for the extent to which Christian principles do operate even in the life and government of this country. I'm not here to disparage these things nor to denounce them. But I am here to say this and it seems to me to be an essential part of the preliminary approach to the gospel. That if you and I are relying upon things like that and imagine that those things are sufficient then it is certain that those are the very things that are preventing our experiencing what the Apostle Paul experienced in his life as a Christian. My friend, uh, we are not saved in nations. We are not saved in families. We are not saved in groups. Your parents can't save you nor make you a Christian. And the fact that you may be the child of the most saintly parents doesn't make you a Christian. That's the central message at this point. 
It doesn't matter what your antecedents are. It doesn't matter what your background. You can't go into heaven on the back of your parents, on the back of your nation, on the back of any group whatsoever. It's impossible. This business of being a Christian is personal and always personal primarily. We must all have personal dealings with God. And we all must come face to face with God one by one. I always like to think of that great word which our Lord spoke about the broad and the narrow way. You remember how he put it. He said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. I rather like to think of that straight gate as a turnstile. You see, what it means is this. You can't go through it even two at a time. Leave alone as a great crowd. There are people who think that a nation can go in and become Christian. That was the tragic fallacy that took place when Constantine, the emperor of Rome, became a Christian and took the whole nation in, as they thought, with him into the church. It can't be done. A number of people can certainly be converted at the same time, and yet it's a series and a number and an aggregate of individual conversions. It's a turnstile, I say. It won't even admit two. It doesn't matter how near and dear the person may be. You can't take with you of necessity your husband, nor your wife, nor your children, nor your father, nor your mother. You, both of you may have the thing at the same time, but you go in one by one. A series of turnstiles. You may be in yours and the other may be there and the other there. But it's a single gate for everyone. It's personal. I wonder whether I'm speaking to somebody who has rather been relying vaguely, generally, upon family or parents or upbringing or... Well, I've always been. I've never even questioned it. Yes, but have you questioned it enough to know perhaps that you're not a Christian? Have you ever examined the thing? Have you looked at yourself in the light of this New Testament? This is Christianity. How do you measure up to that? That's the question. This fatal tendency to rely upon these generalities and thereby to remain outside the kingdom as Paul did before the experience on the road to Damascus. But let me hurry on to something else. There is, I think, no question at all but that the Apostle Paul relied up to a point upon his own ability. I needn't stay with this. I emphasized it last week. The temptation to a man like this to rely upon his own brain power and ability is tremendous. He was a very exceptional man. He had been gifted with an unusual brain. He's a man who shows us so clearly in all his writings that he had one of those cubical minds, those minds that can take in the grand comprehensive sweeps of thought. He's a giant intellectual. There's no question about it. And he was always that. You see, he'd been a very successful student of the Jewish law. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel and he drank it in. And he did well in every examination. He was always on top of the list. He'd been gifted, I say, as we put it by nature, with an extraordinary brain power and capacity. And he liked to think things out. He'd obviously got a most logical mind. He reasoned things. He argued. He debated. He demonstrated. You can't read his letters without seeing all that. And that's all a part of the natural man. These things didn't come to Paul as the result of his conversion. He was always like that. And indeed, he tells us in a bit of autobiography, which you'll find in the 26th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, I verily thought with myself. He worked it out, he reasoned, he argued, he debated it with himself, and he did it with this amazing machine with which he'd been endowed by nature and by his natural birth. And I've no doubt at all, and no hesitation in asserting, that his very ability and intellectuality proved to be a stumbling block to him and kept him outside the kingdom of God which he eventually entered. Now, this again, I think you'll agree, is something that is extremely common. 
I'm describing the sort of man who says, well, I've got my working philosophy of life. I'm talking about the intellectual kind of person who has long since seen the utter folly of attempting to jazz your way through life in this world. I'm talking about the person who tends to despise that kind of butterfly attitude towards life. I'm talking about a man who says life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. I'm talking about the kind of person who says, look here, this business of living is a tremendous thing. And a man must sit down and work it out and have his views and have his ideas and have his philosophy. He must work out his code and he must plan his life according to it. I'm talking about such a person. And what I'm here to say is that that very attitude may be the very thing that is keeping such a person outside the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul certainly believed that about many people. You read again his first epistle to the Corinthians in the first chapter and you'll find that he deals with this very theme. These people who had pride of intellect, the Greeks, the philosophers, the people who said we can think it out, we can work it out, we can have our utopias, we can arrange it all. It's simply a question of thinking things through. And there are many today who seem to think that that is what a Christian is. Their idea of being a Christian is that you've got these views and these ideas, these ideals in your life, and that you're living a life in conformity with your views, and you really are doing that very honestly and very sincerely. They're trusting to their own understanding, to their own views, to their own ideas, and their own plans. And as long as they do so, they will remain outside the kingdom of God and they'll never know this Christian life in all its glory. Why? Well, for this reason. That all that to which they're trusting is inadequate. The world by wisdom, says Paul, knew not God. Job had already put it in the form of a question. He said, can a man by searching find out God? And Job's answer is, no, he can't. And all the might of Greek philosophy had failed. They sought him if happily they might seek after him and find him, but they couldn't find him. The greatest brains of the centuries have been concerned about this question. Man and God, life and destiny, but they can't get there, they can't find him. We need God's revelation. God's action, I say, must come in. It's the great thing that stands out in this story. It's the drawing back of the veil by the Holy Spirit and the giving of the view. That's the way of entry. And as long as a man trusts to himself and his own striving and endeavor, he will remain outside. Will you misunderstand me if I say that I thank God for this? And I'll tell you why I thank God for it. If to be a Christian means that you thus with your own brain and understanding and ability and philosophy work out your views and then practice it, if that's what makes a man a Christian, well then I think it's very unfair. We are not all born with the brain power of an Apostle Paul. We all have the ability of reason and of logic and of understanding and rationalizing things and working it out logically. We can't do it. So that if that is Christianity, I say it has no message, perhaps for the majority of people in the world today. But thank God that isn't Christianity. It isn't this life which a man works out with his own understanding and then lives up to. It isn't a man planning his ideas and putting them into practice. It isn't. It is, as we saw last Sunday night, something that comes from God and is given by God. It's primarily God's action. And thereby it has a hope for all. But let me hurry on. There's something else that proved a hindrance in the case of Paul. The next thing I refer to is his sincerity. 
I verily thought with myself, says Paul, that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Another way of translating that is this. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things. In another place he says this. He says, I have lived in all good conscience all my life. It, he wasn't using idle words, he wasn't making an idle boast. We can be absolutely certain about this, that if ever there was a sincere man in this world, it was Saul of Tarsus before his conversion. You have no right to say anything else about him. He makes that claim himself. I think his life substantiates his claim. The man believed that what he was doing and was saying was right. He believed honestly, genuinely, that Jesus of Nazareth was an imposter and a blasphemer, that he was leading people astray, and that after his death this story of the resurrection had been invented in a sense almost of the devil to lead people astray, and that therefore these Christians who went about preaching it and proclaiming it ought to be exterminated and wiped out of existence, and he thought he was doing God's will by trying to get rid of them. And he was as honest as the day. He was as sincere as a man has ever been. That's the psychological understanding of Saul of Tarsus. Sincere to the very depths of his being, to the very roots of his existence. He did it all in all good conscience. And yet, you see, his whole case is this. What things were gained to me, those I count but loss for Christ. What happened to him on the road to Damascus? Well, this. He discovered that a man can be sincerely wrong, genuinely mistaken. My friends, this isn't a question of sincerity. And yet, how, what masses of people there are in the world tonight who really take up that very position you must have often met it as I've often met it myself. Indeed, it is, I suppose, of all things, the most popular thing to say today. It's put like this. They say, you know, it doesn't really matter what a man believes, as long as he's sincere. Now, there is a sense, of course, in which we all like that, and in which we can all approve of and applaud that sentiment. Insincerity is impossible everywhere. I have no use for the insincere man in any realm or department. I don't care whether he's a preacher, whether he claims to be a Christian, or whether he's a politician, or whether he's a scientist, or a poet, or a philosopher. Insincerity is something hateful and one should abominate it and dismiss it. But it's a very different thing indeed to say that if you're sincere, therefore you must be all right. As I've just put it, you can be sincerely wrong. You can be genuinely mistaken. This man was as sincere as a man could be. But it isn't sincerity that matters. Well, what matters? Ah, it's truth that matters. You see, he was sincere about the wrong thing. And then he saw the right thing, and he became sincere about that. I rather like that way in which he put it to the Galatians that we were considering last Sunday night. You notice the exact parallel. He says, these people had not seen my face. All he knew, they knew was this, that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith he once destroyed. Well, we know, don't we, how he persecuted? He did it with all the intensity of his tremendous nature. The great thing about this man, Paul, and that's why I'm such an unashamed admirer of him, is, of him, is this, that he was great everywhere. He wasn't only a great mind, you know, he'd got a great heart. I like the wholeness of this man. He wasn't one of your controlled, detached uh, philosophers. Uh, who was always so polite that he never let himself go. No, no, this man was all out, whatever side he was on. And when he thought that Christ was a blasphemer, he went down breathing out threatenings and slaughter. He was all out, he was enthusiastic, he was vehement, he was violent. 
And he was exactly the same when he began to preach the faith he once destroyed. He preaches with all the intensity of his noble nature. His heart works with his brain. He's moved. He's ecstatic. He bursts into his apostrophes. He forgets logic, rules of writing and everything else. He's taken up, he's overwhelmed, he cries out, he introduces a hymn of praise in the midst of the most profound logic. He's passionate, he's emotional, of course he is. Exactly as he was before, he still is. The sincerity is there, it's in no sense lessened. He's moved, he's gripped, he's controlled by it. It's the truth that matters, not the sincerity. How terribly dangerous, therefore, it is to say that as long as a man is sincere, nothing else matters. I'm not disputing your sincerity, my dear friend. I'm speaking to somebody at this moment who's not a Christian in this congregation. I'm not saying a word against your character, against your sincerity. I'll grant you that you may be absolutely sincere. The question I'm asking you is this. Are you sincere on the right side? Are you measuring your life and your eternal destiny in terms of sincerity or in terms of truth? Look at this sincere man, how sincerely wrong he was. And how sincerely right he became when he came face to face with the truth and believed it. Oh, the tragedy of relying upon sincerity and thereby shutting yourself outside the kingdom of God and of Christ. But let me come to one other thing. I wonder whether this will surprise anybody. The other thing and perhaps the most important of all the things that kept Paul outside this experience of the Christian life was that he was so religious so religious, not only relying upon his birth and his background and his ability and his zeal and his sincerity, but more than that, you know, relying upon his religion. And this is, of course, of all things the most dangerous for this reason that at this point we are talking about ourselves in our relationship to God. And that is what we are meant to be in a relationship to God. There is nothing that is so dangerous as a wrong or a false religion. It's much more dangerous than all the other things I've mentioned. That was the thing above everything else that kept Paul outside the kingdom. He thought that by persecuting the Christians he was doing God's service. As our Lord predicted, the Pharisees would do. He said that's exactly their position. And Paul was a Pharisee. You see, the trouble is that it substitutes their idea of what religion is for God's idea as to what religion is. That was Paul's trouble, as it is the trouble with all these people. He thought he was pleasing God. He found he was only pleasing himself. He found he was fighting against God. Why? Well, he'd acted on certain assumptions. He thought he knew what it was to be religious. He thought his way was the right way of pleasing God. He acted on his ideas of pleasing God rather than on God's ideas of ple pleasing God. And that was the tremendous thing that he discovered on the road to Damascus. You see, he'd been relying upon forms and ceremonies. He was an expert on that Jewish law with all its ceremonial and all its forms. Quite right, it had been God-given, yes, but the tragedy was that he and others relied upon a mechanical performance of it. And as long as they were doing these various things, they said, all is well. And as long as they thought that they were blind to this other message. How honest he is. He tells us he was very proud of it. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He tells us elsewhere that he excelled all his fellow countrymen in these respects. And again I say he was speaking the simple truth. Wherever you put a man like Paul, he'll always be on the top of the list. Whichever side, I say, he always gets to the top. He was so thorough, he was so able, and he was on the top as a religious man. 
And that is why he is right when he says, It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. He was the chief in a sense. Because he was the most religious, he believed most in this thing that blinds a man to the truth of Christ. He was proud of it. He was self-satisfied. He boasted of it. He gloated in it. And he thought all was well. But here it is. What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Lost, dung, manure, refuse, hateful, ugly, foul. Because it was the thing that blinded him to this righteousness of God which is in Jesus Christ. There are many modern representatives of Saul of Tarsus. There is nothing still even in the world as it is today that stops so many people becoming Christian as religion. What do they trust to? Well, they trust to their forms, their ritual, their ceremony, their chapel or church going, their good deeds, their sacrifices, the time, the energy they give. Yes, they're religious, they're doing it, they say, for God. And they're like Saul of Tarsus. That I may not keep you, shall I try and put what I want to say at this point in the form of an anecdote? Something that I myself witnessed. There was a woman who was quite outstanding in the opinion of those who knew her for her saintliness, for her Christianity. She'd married men who not only didn't pretend to be a Christian, but who lived a sinful and an almost violent life. Bitter, hateful, drinking, gambling. There was this extraordinary couple, the woman unusually saintly and the men living that kind of sinful life. This woman, I say, was regarded as the finest Christian in the church which she attended because the clergyman in charge of that particular church used to find constantly that she was the only person who turned up to the morning communion at seven o'clock. Nobody else came. She was there. And she never missed any service or any meeting. And she went into these things in detail and put them into practice. Married to the gambler, the drinker. Ah, yes, but something very remarkable happened. The gambler and the drinker came under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Actually, he came under its sound because he made a wager and a bet with the men. This man bet him that he wouldn't go and listen to the preaching of the gospel. In order to win his bet, he came. And as the result of his coming, he underwent this great change that took place in Saul of Tarsus. He became a new man, he became a Christian. This is what I want to tell you. That woman living still in the same house and with that man began to feel after a few weeks that she knew nothing at all about Christianity. And she was right. She didn't. She'd had religion. She saw for the first time in her life what Christianity was. She saw it in her converted husband. In the change in the man. In the new man, the new nature, the new life. How he dropped certain things and took up others. Living with the men. She hated her to admit it, but she did. She was honest enough. She saw that this is Christianity and that she'd never been a Christian. She'd just been religious. Forms and ceremonies and services and good deeds and actions and self-denial and all. she was doing it all but she knew that he'd got something she'd never had. And through her own converted husband she saw the difference between being religious and being Christian. And eventually she became a Christian herself when she saw the uselessness of mere religion. 
And how that can stand between one and coming to Christ. He fought here, the struggles, he resented it. Why, he'd been a Christian for years, held up as a pattern and an example. Is this man who's just had some experience to show that he's always been wrong? The flesh doesn't like that. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter like Paul in a sense. Kicking against the pricks like Saul of Tarsus. She didn't like it, but like Saul, she was not disobedient to the heavenly vision when it came. And she became a Christian. If you like, in a sense, she was still as highly religious as before, yes, but it was a new religion. She wasn't relying upon the same things. My dear friends, I mustn't keep you. Religion, you see, can blind people. Yes, they say, I've always believed in God. I've always tried to believe God. I've always said my prayers. I've always tried to do what the Bible says. I've always been interested. All right, my friend, so was Saul of Tarsus. The question we face is, do you know the quality of life that he was living after he became a Christian? Have you got his view of life and of death? Have you got that joy and peace he speaks about? That's Christianity. Do you know that? Do you know that God has dealt with you and met you individually? That's the question. I, will, I won't wait tonight with his zeal. Let me sum it up by putting it like this. The Apostle Paul, you see, came to see that all these things put together are no good, they're of no value, they're lost, they're done, they must be wiped out of existence. Why? Well, for these reasons. All those things depend upon us. They depend upon what we are, whether we are Jews or not, whether we've been brought up in a religious family, a religious country or not, depend upon what we are and they depend upon what we can do, our philosophy, our working it out, our good deeds, our actions, all our activities, all our denials, we are doing it all. It depends entirely upon us. And you see, if that's Christianity then there is no need at all for this great and tremendous change which Paul underwent and which is described in the New Testament as regeneration or the rebirth. But the Christian message, my friend, is to say this, that every man must be born again. It was to Nicodemus of all men, a master of Israel, another great good religious man, that Christ said, you must be born again. Made anew, God must come and take your soul and fashion it afresh. I say again, thank God for this. If those other hypotheses and ideas are true, well, then we are all in a very unequal position, aren't we? Some have been born in different conditions from others, some have had the benefit of a religious family and background and upbringing. Others have not. They've been accustomed to nothing but cursing and blasphemy. Some have great minds, I say. Some haven't and lack ability. Some have been born with a zealous, passionate nature. Others are phlegmatic and cold and can't be moved. And some are born sincere and some seem to be born with a kind of essential treachery to themselves and everybody else. Some seem to be born religious, and some seem to be born rebels and irreligious. And I say, if these are the things that matter and count and determine our destiny, it's unequal, it's unfair, some of an advantage over others. But it isn't Christianity, my friend, don't believe it. That's man's substitute for it, and it's a lie. The Christian message is that we are all lost, every one of us, and all of us equally lost. That all these divisions and distinctions in birth and upbringing and psychology are utterly immaterial. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that by anything in himself or anything that he can do, a man can make himself a Christian is just rubbish and nonsense. We are all lost. We all need to be born again and given new life. Every one of us. The most religious men as well as the men in the gutter. And thank God. 
the message goes on further to say that the same offer of that is made to all who believe it. If you believe these things, well, you'll have it. It's universal in that sense. So all these things are the irrelevances that stand between us and this experience. The last thing I say as I close is this. If all those ideas as to what makes a man a Christian are true, well then you see again Jesus Christ is not essential. He is not vital. You can get on without him. You can rely upon your country, your birth, your upbringing, your goodness, your zeal, your sincerity, your understanding. Christ isn't necessary. You're denying the incarnation. Above all, you're denying his death upon the cross. If it is my brain that's going to make me right, if it's my religion, what I do, and my conformity to these patterns, and all my zeal and enthusiasm, if it's I, I say he's unnecessary. But the whole message of the Christian gospel is just to say this, that God has sent his only son into this world and that he sent him into it in a very special way for the hour that came upon him on the cross on Calvary when his soul was made a sin offering and when he died that we might be forgiven. It's a message which tells us that had not Christ died for our sins, we would yet be in our sins and unforgiven. That God's way of forgiving us is to deal with and to punish our sins in his own Son upon the cross on Calvary's hill. So if you trust to your being religious, you're saying that that was quite unnecessary, a waste of energy, something quite unessential, and thereby you prove, however good and righteous you may be, that you are not a Christian. And while you're not a Christian, you may be proud of your religion, you may be proud of your good works, and proud that you're better than some obvious sinner in a gutter. You know nothing about peace of heart and peace with God. You know nothing of this mastery of life and circumstances. You can't smile in the face of death and say it means going to be with Christ, which is far better. And I'll tell you something even worse. You really are not of much value to anybody else either, because you're self-contained, and you are what you are because you are what you are. And when a poor drunkard, like the man I refer to, or somebody like that, comes to you, you've got nothing to give him. You say, why don't you pull yourself together? Why aren't you like I am? And he can't do it. So you can't help him and you've got nothing to give him. You're very wonderful, but you're useless in society and you're not a benefactor to mankind. But if you're a Christian like the Apostle Paul, you can say, My dear friend, there is as great a hope for you as there was for me. I was the chief of sinners. In my self-righteousness, my pride, my arrogance, my ignorance. I was a royal sinner. And I am what I am by the grace of God. And the grace that sought and bought me can do the same for you. There is everlasting hope for you. Believe as I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and become with me a new man in Christ Jesus. Are you this new man? If not, it's for one of the reasons we've been considering. See it, admit it, confess it, denounce it as Paul denounced it in himself. 
and cast yourself upon the love and mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And he will receive you and bless you. And you will receive life divine. Amen. In my self-righteousness, my pride, my arrogance, my ignorance, I was a loyal sinner. And I am what I am by the grace of God and the grace that sought and bought me can do the same for you. There is everlasting hope for you. Believe as I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and become with me a new man in Christ Jesus. Are you this new man? If not, it's for one of the reasons we've been considering. See it, admit it, confess it, denounce it, as Paul denounced it in himself. And cast yourself upon the love and mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And he will receive you and bless you. And you will receive life divine. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.